Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we are going to talk about machine learning in the cloud and a service called Hyperstack. And at the end of 2023, advent of code was done for me and I wanted to try something new. I wanted to explore a new subject for me and that was cloud compute. Trying to learn how to take a model and learn more about that in the cloud. And I was looking at the big ones. I looked at Azure, I looked at Google, I looked at Amazon and Azure was very complicated. I couldn't really get started with that one. Didn't figure it out. Took like two hours of video lessons and still have not really scratched the surface of that one. Amazon had everything on the line and everything was ready and I asked them for having some compute power so I could have some GPUs and they said no, you should use our other platform over here which is not what I needed for this compute task. So okay and then Google they had everything set up everything ready I had a, a, an environment done and everything, but I didn't have the compute. You needed to ask them in order to get compute. This was Christmas day and I got compute just the other day in January. So it took a long time to request compute. Okay, it was during the holidays, so that might be it, but still it took a long time to get compute. So that is my experience so far. far and then I found Hyperstack. And let's switch over to my screen here. Hyperstack is a platform that I started to work with just because I found that they were pay to, pay to use. So you added um, a balance to them. You gave them money and then you started computing. And if the balance was getting low, you can just fill it up and continue. But you always had some kind of mindset of that you didn't get billed for more than you used. And what I did after I have tried it out for like 50 bucks, I looked at it and figured out that maybe they wanted to sponsor me a little bit so I could play even more with it. So I contacted them and they were pretty awesome people reaching out and talking to me very fast. And we got it set up. So they gave me some compute power. So I get a couple of hours to play around with this platform and I will talk about them. So Hyperstack is actually a product of Nextgen Cloud. And Nextgen Cloud has, was formed uh, or founded in 2020. So they have been around for a while. They have focused on GPU as a service and they have the largest GPU fleets in Europe. And they are very committed to sustainability and are powered by renewable energy. And they are also an NVIDIA elite partner. What is an elite partner? Well, it's the highest level of partner in the partner program at NVIDIA. And it demonstrates that you have a deep knowledge about the technology and different solution using NVIDIA products. And you have a proven track record of actually de deploying and um, um, implementing these kind of solutions. And you're very committed to providing good support to your customers and have been a valuable contributor to the ecosystem. And what you get if you are an elite partner is that you have access to the advanced technology and training and support. And you have priority placement in sales and marketing. And uh, so you really get a really good partner if you're using Hyperstack that has all the cards so you can run them on their system. And what I did after I've got a budget, I ran through and ran a bunch of cards and actually have a large statistics here with all of the data. And we're going to go through that later, but let's take a step back and look at how this actually works. So this is Hyperstack. I have just logged in. I have created an account, gave them some information. And then also I did it, went into the billing of the account and filled my um, account up with some money so I can actually do stuff. And 
the first thing you did after that is that you needed to create an environment. An environment is pretty much a place where you will put other stuff. It's where it's the highest level, the root of everything, and you can set up a lot of different things in your environment. But when you create an environment, you need to decide which data center to put your data. So either you can run it in Canada, where you have a lot more cards at the moment, or you can run it in Norway, which is closer to me. Um, and so that, that's an option for you where, where you want to put your data and also run your compute. Uh, next up, we needed com uh, a couple of key pairs. And these key pairs are to log into the machines to actually can yeah, log in and do stuff on them, uh, which is also very good. Uh, firewalls, I haven't used this functionality yet, but I guess this could be very uh, beneficial if you are need, need that for any service that you set up. Uh, they have a marketplace that is coming where they will have deployments that you can deploy. So I guess that that is kind of images or similar things that you can run in your uh, environments. Um, and when it comes to billing, you just fill up. Uh, in this organization tab, you can customize your organization, creating roles, adding members and so on in order to give them access to different things. And these roles are pretty involved. So you can see what kind of things are available to the person that has this particular role. So if you are an account manager, you can do a lot with your uh, company and give different people different roles. And we also have an API where you can generate an API key, start stop volumes and start stop virtual machines, create volumes and so on via the API, which could be beneficial if you want to use this outside of the actual web uh, interface. Next up, when I have created all this, I went in under volumes here and we see that I already have a vo work volume here that I could mount in any of my um, virtual machines, but let's create a new volume. So here we create a new volume, we decide where to put it. We can put it in Norway, new volume. And when we have done that, we could install a, an operating system on it. In my case, I run all my compute in Ubuntu because the model is already built on Ubuntu. But you see that you have CentOS, Debian, Fedora and Windows to choose from as well. And then you need to set the size. And I have created volumes of the size of 100 gigabytes. And when you do that, they will, as SSD, cost about a cent an hour. So pretty affordable uh, if you create it like that. You could give it a callback URL. If you have any changes to the volume, it could send information there and you can add a description. Uh, so after we've created this volume, it will be created. It will build and add Ubuntu to it. And that can take a little while. Uh, so this is what we want to use later on. Uh, if we go in under virtual machine here, if I want to deploy a virtual machine, I click on deploy, and then you need to give this a name, my machine, you can say, and then you select an environment. We are still in Norway here. And later down here, we have all the kind of machines I can set up. And in Norway, as I said, there are few less cards. So here I have uh, A100, RTX, A4000, 4000, 5000, 6000, and so on. Um, and you can also create this CPU only machine. And this is more for setup and installing the environment, adding any dependencies and so on. So that is what I set up first. And a small environment in Norway is good enough in order to set up things. But keep in mind that you look at the actual setup of this machine when you're creating it. Because if we go over to uh, Canada here, for instance, a small is much smaller. It's just two v v um, CPUs and one gigabyte of memory. And when I installed my dependencies, one gig was too small in, uh, to run the actual build script. 
So I had to change it up to a large one so I can actually run the install process. So keep that in mind, but you see here in Canada, we have a lot more of these kind of cards. We have one A100, uh, we have H100, we have uh, LVL40 and so on. And they have also separated these up in different machines. So you have one A100 small where you can have one or two GPUs. And then you have a one that is a little bit larger here with four and eight GPUs. And there is also one eight GPUs with over in NVLink if your model is set up in that way. Um, and you can also run it in Kubernetes if that is required for your compute. So they have one of those kind of clusters as well. Uh, but we are, if we go back to Norway again here, we create a CPU only machine. Then further down here, we can choose existing volume and I will choose my new volume here. And then I will create, uh, choose my key pair here. And further down here, I can choose to assign a public IP to it and I can install NVIDIA drivers. And you also have a callback that you can attach. You can attach a, U a U uh, Jupyter Notebook. You could have a cloud in its script and you can have a provi provisioning pro profile. Uh, but at this moment, I just install the drivers and the rest I will do manually. So if we deploy this machine here, we can see that it's starting to create a machine. It will build the machine and then give me a ta uh, access with a public IP here. And the IP is costing a small amount, less than a cent per hour. But still, if you don't particularly need to have a public I IP to upload things or do th things there, you can save a little money by not attaching a public IP. It's something that is costing them money, so I understand that they charge for it a little bit. Um, but keep that in mind, if you don't need it, you could use this uh, OpenVNC client instead and have full access to the machine. We see that it's currently starting up, but this is limited. You can't really copy paste to it and so on. So I prefer to have an uh, IP and then I give myself access by just enabling access. So this, is, this machine is um, very secure from the beginning, but when you give yourself access, you have access with your key. So if we go over to my console here, copy paste this in and run this. It asks me if I want to approve this key uh, fingerprint and I do that. And then I'm inside of the machine. So now I'm running in this particular machine and I have access to install stuff. One thing to keep in mind is that I could fetch, let's say a Git uh, repository, Git is already installed. I could upload data to this over uh, SSH and do that and, and work with this. But if you want to install dependencies and you want to add dependencies to the system, if I run top here, you can see that it's actually installing dependencies right now. Uh, I'm not sure if it's showing up at the moment, but somewhere here we will see that it, there is a script running installing a bunch of dependencies in order to get your GPU drivers and so on up, uh, set up. Uh, and before you have run this full script, you are not able to install Debian packages because it will have that resource. So if we uh, look at the drive here, we have an installer script here. So this is the script that they are actually running to install the NVIDIA drivers and so on. So when this is done and have installed everything, then you can actually run this, um, run your own dependencies and add those to the system. Um, so that was this machine. I have already prepared this uh, with everything needed. So let's go back to virtual machines again here, deploy another virtual machine. Let's call this work machine. And um, we have this in Norway as well. And here I will just take one of the cheaper models here. We have one RTX uh, 400. We can even take two uh, 4,000. Uh, 4, so we put that in there. And then I 
choose a volume. I have my work volume here that is already working on. I add my key pair again, assign a public key and deploy that. So now this is starting up and now I'm not installing the NVIDIA drivers. So this is already prepared. This is a volume that I have run multiple times, trying different configurations out and so on. So this is a, a very used uh, volume. So there isn't not much to actually build on it or do stuff. It's just setting up the work machine, starting it up uh, and getting it up and running. So that's what we are waiting for here. So now it's active. Let's see if it has started yet in the console. It's still starting up. Should be done pretty soon here. Um, the machines in Norway are very fast to start up and get ready. So here we are. We will enable this access, fetch the uh, login information. So now I'm in this machine here. I have my setup already available. If we look at NVIDIA SMI, we can see that we have two cards ready to run. And if I run uh, TTS and then go into my Python environment and I can just start training on this model. Uh, so however your model is set up or however it actually works to run uh, multiple GPUs, you set that up and you start running it. And it's pretty much all you need to do. If we copy paste this again here, I can open another console, log in there, and check this my again here. So when this actually starts running here, we see that it's restoring a checkpoint, loading it up, yeah, loading all the instances in, and this is training on 14,000 instances and on two different GPUs. I think it should get started here. Now we can see that I actually have two Python processes already running in the GPU memory here. And we can see what, uh, what percentage the CPU fan is running, how hot the card is, how much power usage you have over here and GPU utilization. So. You can follow along if you want to, but it, you have all the access that you want. Now, I'm, <laughs> this model can't really run on this uh, GPU because it has too li little memory. I usually run this on models with a lot more memory. Uh, so let's get out here again, go back to the machine list. And in here, I have already shut off the under machine. So let's stop this machine as well. And what you can do when you have the machines here, you can either uh, stop, start, you can hard reboot them if needed. You can hibernate a VM and every VM that is hibernated, you don't pay for. So if you want to run a training process, download the result and then check it and verify and so on, you can hibernate the VM and then get back to it and continue training at a later date if you want to. And of course you can delete it and deleted virtual machines, you don't pay for those either. So let's uh, remove both of these. So uh, I don't get uh, any more charge on my account here and get back to my presentation. So I run this through a lot of different cards and try to figure out what is the best card for doing work on this, these machines and get the most done. And what is the best card if I want to be cost um, conscious to have use as little money as possible and get the, the most uh, compute from them and so on. So if we look at some graphs here, here we have epochs per hour on my particular model. I need to stress that this is on my model. So every model is a little bit different. If you are running an AI model with a chat GPT or something like that, you have a lot of samples. So the epochs will be longer and you can uh, do it parallel, a lot, a lot parallelized. But in my case, I had fewer mod, uh, samples, so I can't run as many in parallel. So in this case, we can see here that the best one is of course the H100. Um, which is almost 40 epochs per hour. Uh, 100, A100 can run a little bit over 30, uh, but my local card, my own card can run 10 in an hour. 
on my local uh, 3090, you know, 3080. So we see here that it, it's a spread over the cards. The L40 is a little bit better than the A6000. So I didn't know much about these cards. So getting a, a feel on how good they actually are uh, individually and uh, also if you run multiple of them. So I uh, tried to check uh, what was the most cost effective. And of course, if you look at this, I could run so much more locally. <laughs> um, so I can run a lot of things per dollar locally, but that is not really fair because yeah, I'm, I'm just paying for the electricity here. Uh, but if we look at just the cloud models here, in my case for this model, an A5000 was actually the most uh, work per dollar for this particular model. But it's probably because I don't have that many samples. If you have more samples and you can load more into the GPU, more, um, more memory space in these H100 and A100 could probably be beneficial, but my model is so small. So I can't really um, get that much out of these cards. Uh, I need to have more data. And if we look at the actual curve here, we can see that for the A5000, it's pretty much doubling in speed if I do more. So if I have one, it takes, uh, it can do like, uh, I think 15, if I have two, it can do 21. And if I have three, it can do almost 40. And if I have um, eight, I can or do almost 80. The curve is similar on the H100, but it's flatter. So you don't benefit as much on the H100. And I think that is the reason. I think this, pillar here over uh, at the eight cards could be a lot higher if I just had more data in my model. Uh, doing this analysis and actually trying all the different kinds of batch sizes on all the different GPUs, so I ran through all of this, it took a couple of hours to do, of course, and I think I spent around $100 to try all the different uh, combinations and running one epoch or two epochs per core and then counting how long time it took uh, between each epoch. So you can actually go through and do your own research on your model to figure out what is the best model, uh, best uh, GPU for your use case to get the most out of your model either in price or in compute. Uh, and do that pretty safely by just uh, adding the, as much money that you want to spend for this experiment and then just use uh, the service as is. And I had never any problem to get any access to any cards. I just started up a machine and started computing. So this is what I wanted to show you today. I hope that you found this interesting. What kind of models would you run on this kind of service? Leave a comment in the comment section down below. Do you want to do with it, use it for anything else? Don't train a model. Maybe you have any other comp GPU task. Leave a comment about that as well. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. If you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. And I really hope to see you in the next video.